Even if you didn't know anything about investing, there's a good chance that you'd have heard of the S&P 500. It's a world famous index, comprising of 500 of the largest publicly traded companies in the USA. It's often used as a benchmark for other funds to contend with, and as some sort of representation of the total stock market. As UK investors, we have a few options when it comes to investing in the S&P 500, but one of the more popular options is the USA. Vanguard's S&P 500 ETF. The fund has a whopping 29 billion in assets, making it the most popular fund on Vanguard's platform. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into VUSA, explaining all of the key information that you need to know. Then, we're going to discuss whether or not investing in the S&P 500 is as good of an opportunity as it is made out to be. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video, because some of the points that we're going to make are definitely going to make you think twice about swearing by the S&P 500. Just remember that we are not professional financial advisors, so if you want independent advice tailored to your own circumstances, then you should seek that from a pro <laughs> Then you should seek that from a professional. Now, without wasting any more time, let's get into it. The S&P 500. 500 world leading companies from the world's largest economy. The S&P 500 is so significant that it is often called the market and it sets a benchmark for active managers and other indices to compete with. Over the past 100 years, the annualized returns have been 7.63% after inflation and with reinvesting dividends. And over the last 10 years, the annualized returns have been a whopping 12.06%. The index is filled with world leading companies. It is simply a privilege to make it into the 500. As well as meeting size, trading and earnings requirements, companies must be approved by a committee before joining the prestigious index. Then, ETF and index fund providers such as Vanguard create funds that aim to track the index. In the UK, Vanguard provide the fund the USA, the S&P 500 ETF. It's the second cheapest S&P 500 ETF in the UK behind the Invesco S&P 500 ETF, SPXP. Nevertheless, it's still a very cheap fund and a great option. To learn more about it, we're going to go to Vanguard's UK website. From the homepage, click what we offer, then ETFs. Scroll down to the USA section, where you'll find the S&P 500 ETF. Click on it to learn more about it. This is the overview page, which has most of the key information that you need to know about the fund. First of all, we have the market price, which is currently around £56. On Vanguard's UK platform, you can only buy whole shares, not fractional shares. So this market value can kind of be thought of as a minimum investment. Next, we can see that the fund holds 507 stocks, making it fairly well diversified. But more on that later. Finally, the ongoing charge of the fund is 0.07%, making it the cheapest fund available on their website. This is a huge selling point of the fund. The lower the ongoing charge, the more of your returns that you get to keep. 0.07% is about as low as it gets, and you really can't argue with that level of value. There is a small paragraph explaining that the fund aims to track performance of the S&P 500 index, which comprises of large size company stocks in the US. To learn more about what the fund is made up of, we'll head over to the portfolio data tab. If you scroll down, you can see the weighted exposure to each market sector within the fund. The fund has over a quarter of its assets invested in the information and technology sector, which is to be expected. However, it still has a good spread across many market sectors, which is why the S&P 500 is considered to be representative of the US markets. If you scroll down further, you can see some info on the holdings within the fund. The first page shows the top 10 holdings, which include some of the world's biggest and most famous companies. Apple, which is the top holding, makes up almost 6% of the entire index, whilst the top 10 holdings add up to a whopping 27%. This means that the index is very top heavy. The largest companies will have a huge amount allocated to them, while some of the smaller companies will just have a fraction of a percent allocated to them. Next, we'll move on to the distributions tab, where you can find the dividend yield of the ETF, which is currently around 1.1%. The dividends are paid out on a quarterly basis as cash into your account which you would have to manually reinvest. You have a choice to either withdraw the cash, reinvest it into USA, or invest it into another fund on the platform. The next tab is the cost and minimums tab, which states that there is a 500 pound minimum lump sum investment or a 100 pound minimum monthly direct debit. Or if you don't have a Vanguard account open already, you can simply set up a direct debit, cancel it before you get charged, and then you'll be able to invest under those minimums. Just remember that as a minimum, you will have to purchase one whole share of the CTF. So that's a roundup of all of the information that you need to know on Vanguard's website. But there is more to consider. Should you invest in the S&P 500? Is it as good as it's made out to be? 
and is there anything that you need to look out for? Typically, people love the S&P 500 because it is diversified, low cost and has great performance. But we're going to challenge the norm and give you a few points to consider that might make you think twice before swearing by the S&P 500. The first point that we want to consider or challenge is the diversification aspect of the S&P 500. As mentioned before, the S&P 500 is sometimes used as a representation of the markets. If the S&P 500 is doing well, then surely the markets must be doing well. It's also argued that the S&P 500 is essentially globally diversified, as it is filled with global companies. With modern business dynamics, the world economy is as connected as ever. So some people believe that global companies like Apple, Facebook and Alphabet are not just representative of the US markets. With such a global reach, they could represent the global markets. Now, we just want to make this clear, we do not completely disagree with this, because it is a fair point. If the US economy was to struggle, I'm sure that companies like Apple and the like would still be able to sell their products globally and make a profit. But this does not necessarily mean that investing in the S&P 500 is a substitute for investing in a properly globally diversified portfolio. If you just take a step back, it's clear that investing in 500 companies from one country does not make your portfolio global. Let's say that the Korean markets were to boom over the next 10 years and provide annualized returns of 20%. Is this epic growth going to be reflected in the returns of the S&P 500? No. I mean, yes, you could argue that the sales of some companies would boost a little, and a boom in the Korean economy could have a slight impact on the S&P 500 returns. But realistically, if you actually want to capture that growth, you're going to have to somehow be directly invested into the Korean markets. You could do this by investing in a global fund or ETF, or at least some combination of funds that make up a global portfolio. Also, it's worth mentioning that the S&P 500 only includes 500 of the largest companies in the USA. Large cap US companies are not going to be representative of, let's say, small or medium sized companies in Europe. If you want proper global diversification, then you should build a global portfolio. Unfortunately, we don't think the S&P 500 is gonna quite cut it. The next point that we want to tackle is chasing returns. Whether we like it or not, one of the reasons that the S&P 500 is so popular is because of the consistently positive returns that it has produced. If the S&P 500 had an annualized return of 2% over the past 100 years, do you really think anybody would care about it? Now, we're not saying that an index that happens to have historically high returns is necessarily a bad thing, we're just saying that this has no relation to how the index will perform in the future. As we mentioned, the S&P 500, especially recently, has been on a great run. Over the past 10 years, the annualized returns of the index have been 12.06%. That's after inflation and with dividends reinvested, which is just crazy. We simply just cannot expect the next 10 years to be as lucrative as the last 10 years. Now, I just want to be clear, it is not impossible, but theoretically, the probability is extremely low. If you're investing in the S&P 500, just make sure that it's for the right reasons. If you're investing in the fund, aiming to chase those past returns, then you're investing in it for the wrong reasons. As a matter of fact, the last 10 years may come at a price, which leads us right onto our third point. The S&P 500 has become expensive. Now, there are a few ways to measure how expensive a stock or a fund is but one of the most common is the trailing P-E ratio. The P-E ratio, or the price to earnings ratio, can be calculated by dividing the current share price by the earnings per share. So for the trailing P-E ratio, you just use the earnings per share for the last 12 months. The higher the P-E ratio, the more expensive something is considered to be. This is because you are basically paying a high price for the same earnings from a set company. The P-E ratio is typically high when investors are expecting higher earnings in the future, so they're willing to pay a high price for them now. Unfortunately, the P-E ratio for the S&P 500 has been creeping up over time. Around 100 years ago, the P-E ratio of the S&P 500 was around 16, but as of December 2020, the P-E ratio was 38.2. This rising P-E ratio, or expensiveness, partly explains the higher returns that the S&P 500 has produced recently. Now, this is to be expected, because assets have generally inflated in price from what they once were. But for reference, the P-E ratio for the global markets as of December 2020 is around 27. This is just one indicator that large cap US stocks are overpriced at the moment, which might make them a poor investment. If you pay a high price for them now, then the future expected returns are inherently lower. But at the end of the day, this is simply food for thought and a little bit of harmless speculation. Ultimately, we have no idea how the S&P 500 will perform in the future or what the best investment choices will be. We just wanted to highlight some key considerations that you should be conscious of before investing in the fund. There's no arguing that the S&P 500 is a great index to track, and by investing in VUSA, you can do it cheaply. 
If you were to invest in the S&P 500 with a long-term mindset, investing consistently and sticking with a plan, you'd definitely be set on a good course. But we just wanted to get across the point that just because something is popular, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the best investment option for you. It's important to keep an open mind when it comes to selecting a fund or an investment strategy. And you need to make sure that you consider all sides of the equation. And with that tip, we'll leave it there. As always guys, thanks for watching.